one of you people have to use the bathroom is the first door on the right. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I have a, yeah. Uh, today's date is April 6, 1995. Uh, we are interviewing Esther B. Lang. I am Brenda Ferdman. We're in Skokie, Illinois, in the United States of America. Our language is in English. My name is Brenda Ferdman, F E R D M A N. Today is April the 6th, 1995. I'm conducting an interview with Esther Lang in Skokie, Illinois, the United States of America. Your name, please. My name is Esther. My middle initial is B. Lang, L-A-N-G. And um, what was your name at birth? Esther Luby Bernstein. Did you have any uh, other names that you were called? No. Any nicknames at all? Well, I had a nickname called Eshi, but that was not till I was living underground. And your birthday? March 16, 26. And how old are you? 69. And where were you born? I was born in Munich, Germany. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what life was like for you in Germany? Well, when I was born, and uh, we lived in Munich in a very nice part. It was not an, ex um, an exceptionally Jewish neighborhood that we lived in. And I personally never had any problems with the Germans. In fact, the building where we used to live in was owned by a baker. His son was a member of the SR. And when Jews were no longer permitted to go into stores, he would come up to us and say, don't worry, I will get you anything you want. Could you tell us what the SR is? Uh, the SR is... Uh, I really don't know what the abbreviation stands for, but uh, it's, it's a socialist uh, organization that was initiated by Hitler, I guess. Who comprised your household? My father, mother, sister, and myself. My father was hardly ever at home because he was a director of a shoe factory in another province, so he would come home every other week or so. But we spent an awful lot of time with my grandparents. And I was, I was very close with them, and they lived in a Jewish neighborhood. Was that your maternal? Or Those were my maternal grandparents. How often did you get together with them? Oh, at least once a week, at least. And uh, I was going to a uh, Jewish uh, parochial school. And uh, went there for a few years, and after that, um, let me see, it was close, in, in 38 we had Kristallnacht, and I had gone to school that morning, but there was nothing doing, so I just left and I went to the store of my grandparents, my grandparents had a shoe store, and I was, I was across the street and I looked at it and the, the whole store was just one big mess, everything in ruins. And I went over to this SR man and I asked him, what's going on? And he said, oh, we just ruined the Salyut, the Salyut is German for about this damn Jew, uh, store. So I went back across the street and called my grandparents and said, There's n nobody should get out of the house, just stay, because they didn't even know what was going on. My, my grandfather at that time was not home because he was a Polish Jew and the Germans had taken all the Poles, put them on a train and shipped them east. But the Polish government didn't let them in. So they went back west. So they were shoveled back and forth for a few days and then finally he was released. Okay, let me back up just a little bit uh, before Kristallnacht. Um, you were around 10 years old? Mm-hmm, 10, 12 years old, yeah, 10, 11 years old probably, yes. What was your Jewish community life like? Well, we belonged to an Orthodox synagogue because there was no conservative, no reform. There was either Orthodox or liberal. The liberal synagogue had a organ. That's what made it liberal. 
men and women were separated. And the Orthodox synagogue where my grandparents and we belonged was an Orthodox one. And we would go there on the holidays. Um, on Shabbat, our nursemaid would take us to the liberal synagogue occasionally. But something else, that we, at, in Germany, even uh, before Kristallnacht, we had really a comfortable life. We would go on vacations and everything. And I re still remember in 1936, uh, there were the uh, Winter Olympics in Garmisch, Partenkirchen, in the southern part of Germany. And I was skiing, and I sprained my ankle. And then an, an S. Amann again picked me up and took me down, holding me in his arm, never realizing that he was saving a Jewish girl. But, I mean, that was it. So nobody ever spat at me, beat me up, or anything. This never happened to me personally. What kind of uh, subjects did you study in school? What did I study? Just what I studied here in, uh, in grade school, and besides that, I had some uh, uh, Jewish subject. We had to learn to read and translate the Sidur and the Chumash. Uh, but it's not like now, because if you asked me what I learned there, I could say zilch. Um, I learned how to read and translate, but I, it never sank in what I translated, because when, I, when we would ask that the teacher explain, oh, don't worry about it, it's not interesting, it's not important, just keep on translating. So, really, the education was not much to, say, to talk about. What was your favorite subject, though? Physical education. That was my favorite. Did you belong to any clubs or organizations? Yes, uh, I did belong in Munich to the, what's called ITUS. What does that stand for? Jewish Turnverein, like a Jewish uh, exercise club, gymnastics club, that's what it stood for. I would go there a few times a week. How was that set up? We would have uh, regular gymnastics, and then we would work on the rings and the parallel bars and the regular bars and then the ropes. We would then, out, when the weather was nice, we would run outside track, the track meets. Was there uh, adult supervision? Oh, sure, there was adult supervision, but I don't remember who that was. And describe for me your relationship with your sister. Well, my sister and I were five years apart, so outside of fighting, we really didn't have much of a relationship because she was so much younger than I was, because she didn't even go to school in Germany. Who um, got away with most mischief? I guess we both did our share. Tell me a little bit about some of the tricks you might have done. What I had done? Well, once... A girl bothered at me. I don't know why, what I did to her, why she bothered at me, I don't know. But anyway, she was sitting in front of me. In those days, we, we were writing with ink pens, not like here with wall pens, but with ink pens. And there was a, an inkwell on my desk. And I took her a braid, and I swooshed it through the ink. And of course, I was dispelled from school for being so absolutely naughty. What was the reaction from your family? Well, I guess that my father had to laugh because he had to go to school afterwards. And I said, well, he's not my father because he looked always very young. I said, that's not my father. It's my, my big brother, but he will bail me out. Don't worry about that. He did bail me out. How long were you expelled for? I don't remember. I really don't remember. Maybe a few days. Were you very embarrassed? No. What was... Uh part of your day after school, for example? Well, after school, most of the time, the nursemaid would pick us up and we would walk home. Then maybe we would play a little bit in the back. And it was not a yard, but we had a front. And then you walked in the back, and uh, there was an area where you would play, and there was an area where people would come down and do their laundry, and then behind that there was another uh, apartment well, building, this much cheaper place because they didn't have a view or anything, and, and, but they had children, we would just play together. What? And that was really all, it was nothing, ex nothing exciting. 
what was your neighborhood like? Describe the looks of the neighborhood. As far as I remember, it was a very nice neighborhood. There were all apartment buildings. There were no single homes at all. We were close to a park, and they had a playground. And then there was a, a pinacotheque. It was a, an art museum. When I looked at the map, my husband showed me the map. I was not too far away from a university. So it was a very nice area, really. There were no stores, or hardly any stores in the area. What was transportation? How did you get from one area to another? Streetcar and foot. You put one foot in front of the other and you got there. It's not like here where if you don't have a car, oh my God, how am I going to get there? We, we had a car. Later on we had a car which my father always took. and. Uh, but when we had to go to my grandparents, we either took a streetcar or we walked. I mean, the distances are not like here. Where did you gather <clears throat> for a Shabbat dinner? Mm -hmm. Sometimes in our house, sometimes went to my grandparents' house and stayed there overnight. Were there extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles? I did have two uncles. One at that time was not married, and he was there, and another one who was married, and he hardly ever showed up. And the cousins, the one that never showed up, he had a child, but that was very, uh, let's see, he was much too young. He never showed up either. Those are the only real cousins I have. I only have one. Describe a typical Shabbat evening. Well, my grandfather would go to services, and then he would come home. He would make Kiddush, and then we would have a Shabbat meal. We would bench, we would say grace, and then we would go to bed. And then the next morning, he, my grandfather would take us to services. I mean, would take me to service. My sister was too small. And that was Shabbat, and then in the evening, we would make Havdalah and get ready for another week. Was there a lot of political talk in your family? Well, I, as far as I remember, in 1936, they started talking about America in 37, where we're going to, where we're going to America. And, but usually, when they did talk about things that were serious, in the moment my sister and I would come, they would just keep quiet. We don't say anything in front of the children. Um, my grandfather did have a sister in New York, and I guess they wanted to contact her. For some unknown reason, they never t talked about Palestine, which is now Israel. They never did that, even though I have oodles of family there now. How did uh, Hitler's rise to power affect you personally? Not really. It may have affected my father in his uh, in his position. Uh, maybe we couldn't go on vacation where we wanted to go, but I really don't know because whatever my parents took us, we had a good time. And as I said, even in 1937, 38, when things got bad, we met nice Germans. So well, we never were about it, really. The only time is when, when my father left in 37, he went to Holland. We followed in 1938, so my mother was packing, and uh, some from the police or whoever, I don't remember, came to look around. What do you want? We were looking for Mr. Bernstein. Well, Mr. Bernstein is not here anymore. And they made a total pest out of themselves, turning everything upside down while we were packing. And then they left because my father wasn't there. We packed, and then we uh, immigrated to the Netherlands. What, were, what was the final <clears throat> uh, conclusion? What was the final result of, of what made your, your parents decide to leave? Because my, 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 see, this was a typical European household. My father made the decisions, and my mother followed. My father probably saw the handwriting on the wall, but he didn't see it very well because then he would have gone farther away. 
And uh, he said that there's no future, let's go to Holland, which is neutral, which was always neutral, so we just go to Holland. And he went and he had a position r right away. And then about a year later we followed. Did you emigrate legally to Holland? Yes, yes. Oh God, if you could not go in there legal, uh, illegal. Holland was very, very strict. This is why my grandparents eventually ended up in Belgium because they wouldn't let any people in. Describe to me again this Kristallnacht. Well, the only thing that I remember about Kristallnacht is when I went to school and somebody said something that they just uh, destroyed the uh, Jewish stores and the synagogues. I just went there and they saw that. And I'd, everybody told me that I didn't look Jewish, having blue eyes and blonde hair. And I went over there and just asked that is Amon what he had done. And the store was just in shambles. But it was not set afire because it was in, the, in between other stores, Gentile stores. So they just made a mess out of it. They just broke all the glass and, and threw all the shoes all over the place. I mean, it was a shoe store. And that's what, as far as I know, the liberal synagogue was destroyed before because Hitler had said it spoiled his uh, view. And uh, they had to dynamite the area and made a parking lot out of it. So then apparently he had a better view. Um, there were some other orthodox synagogues, but they were more what you call a stiebel, you know, very small things. And the one we went to that's called the Reichenbach Synagogue, they couldn't burn, <coughs> excuse me, they couldn't burn that one either because it was in between other houses. So if that would have been out of control, they were afraid the other houses would go too. That yeah. was all that I remember about Kristallnacht. Personally. What were people doing? in the streets. I really don't remember what I have read that they were beating up Jews and uh, and I mean there were signs uh, on, on stores Juden nicht allowed, the Jews were not permitted to go in there only at certain times. Um, but there again, the people that we lived was uh, they did all the shopping for us. We had no problem with that. The, I do remember ha having been told that my younger uncle was beaten up once because he went out with a Gentile girl, so suits him right for that far. But uh, personally, I was never beaten up, as I said, never spat on or anything. What restrictions were placed on you and your family then? Personally, really nothing, because after Kristallnacht, we went back to our apartment and we just started, uh, we, we rather continued packing and we left. We left very legally, all our papers were in order, we just went on the train and we left. What, what did you take with you? Everything that was nailed down, what they would consider now a lift. When they go to Israel, we took our furniture along, the dishes, clothes, you name it, we took it. We just were checked uh, when we crossed the border from Germany to Holland. We were checked by the Germans, and we had a woman. And uh, she asked some very stupid questions, and then, of course, got stupid answers. I don't want this to go on the tape, but uh, they were nasty to other people because, uh, for instance, that we saw a, a Jewish man who had his talus and film with him, and they asked him, what is that stupid thing for? show us, and he, they asked him to do that. But they never bothered us. We just, they, we were investigated, every, all the papers were in order, and we just left. We went on to Holland, and then my dad picked us up there. Was there a place waiting for you? Yes, my dad was working, uh, it was more or less a village, where he had a position as a director in the shoe factory, and there we stayed for a few weeks in a hotel. And then after that, we moved to Tilburg, which was a bigger city, and my dad commuted on the bicycle to, that, to his job, and we rented a house because there were hardly any apartments. It was all either you owned it or you rented a house. 
at that time you were still, were you living as a Jewish family? Yes, oh yes, yes. We were living as a Jewish family and uh, I went to school, I had a tutor to teach me Dutch and then eventually I went to uh, the Dutch grade school. But that didn't last too long and then I went to a, hi uh, a Dutch high school and uh, but that time the Germans were there already. That was about 40, the beginning of 40, 40, 41. And I had to do an exam and then I had to go to Rotterdam. And anytime you went outside of your area, you needed a permit. And I had a permit from the Germans. I went to Rotterdam and took the exam. And then I saw a lot of Germans and a lot of people running around, running around. And I had, by that time, I was wearing my star, which I covered. And I went up to somebody and I said, what's going on? I said, this girl disappeared. They are rounding up all the Jews. Um, I called my parents and I said, don't you people know what's going on? Nobody had told them what was going on, that there was a big raid in Rotterdam. And then I went back to the train, and I went back to, or to Tilburg after my test and after what I had seen. Were there a lot of Jewish people in Tilburg? Not too many. We had German Jewish, Polish Jewish, and then the Dutch Jewish. And uh, we had one synagogue. We didn't have a rabbi. It was a small place. We didn't have a rabbi. He was a chazan. He was really chief cook and bottle washer because he was the teacher and he conducted services. Then, um, about 1941, all the uh, professors were dismissed from their posts in the universities. So the Germans said that because we could no longer attend any Gentile schools, they would give us our own school, which was in Zertochenbosch, which was the capital of North Brabant, which is a province. And so we went there, and, this, and we really tried to learn something, but every Friday we would have a raid and they would pick up some, some children. Now the teachers were fantastic because they were all professors, but it was not very conducive to learning. And on, of course then we had again our travel permit from the Germans. And to, in Den Bosch, they had a lot of specialized schools like uh, teach their special teacher colleges and colleges where you would learn um, technical subjects and so forth. And those were all Gentiles. And we got very friendly with them. I mean, the Germans on the, on the train, they would just swoop down on us and ask for our permits. And we would show it to them. They would leave us alone because we were, we were about six or seven Jews from Tilburg and surrounding area, and we had all the papers that were okay, so they didn't bother us. And I got to know one fellow, and I became rather friendly with him. And we talked about it, what was going to happen, because that was in the back of our minds, that they would start collecting us and sending to work camps. He says, no, 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 you're not going to work camp. You go and live with us. Uh, so then his pa uh, parents and my parents, they got together and discussed it. Okay. Then eventually the day came when the chief of police, he was Dutch, of course, there was the Dutch police. We were very friendly. He would come and say, you better disappear. I have an order to round up all the Jews. So we got this order, then we just disappeared and we moved in with his family. And now they, uh, so what we did, we lived, they had a big house. The father of this fellow was the principal of the school. The school was right next to uh, to his house. It's almost like a, a parish and, and a church. I mean, that was the close uh, proximity. Now, they had this, the parents had decided that it wasn't safe for us to stay there at night for us. That means my mother and me, because my dad went to Amsterdam. It's just my sister, mother, and myself, we went into hiding. And every night when it was dark, we would drag ourselves over there to that school and lie down on a mattress, which was hidden during the day. And then in the morning, he would pick us up again. We went back to the house. Now, that was really a blood-curdling experience, going there every night in the pitch black, and then just try to get this, uh, this, uh, this 
mattress out and then put everything back again in the morning. But everything was black. There was always a total blackout. Uh, their oldest son was very active in the illegal organization. And one day we were warned that should there be anybody hiding in that house, we had to disappear because the Germans definitely would come looking for him. So the word was given to the illegal organization. They picked us up again in the middle of the night and took us to another place. Now, I was the only one who had a false paper, which I had stolen. The illegal had removed the picture of the girl that I had stolen it from and put in my picture. How, did you, how were you able to, where was this girl? This girl was vis visiting us, and she had her bicycle parked in our backyard. And uh, my dad said, go get it, and she said, I keep her busy. And I went out and looked in her uh, purse, which she had on the bicycle. And sure enough, it was there, and I took out the ID. I was not very nice, but it's just a matter of life and death, really. So I took it. So I was the only one who had, a, um, who had false papers. We went to uh, the illegal brought us to this family, and I referred to them as Tante, which means Anne and Ohm, which is Dutch for uncle. And they received us, and they were absolutely fantastic. They said, welcome. We don't have much, but whatever we have, we shall share with you. But that time, we didn't have much money left. And they were absolutely great. Now, we lived in a row house, like they would have here, what they call it here, um, where you have one house connected to the other. Well, the English just doesn't come back. But anyway, um, we had a bedroom for the three of us. There was no bathroom, but you can keep yourself clean by washing. You don't need a bathroom. And they were both workers. He was a weaver, and she was a cleaning lady. Before it was permitted for Jews to have servants, she was a full-time housekeeper, housemaid, whatever, in a Jewish family. So she was up to date with all the dietary laws about all the holidays. So even when there would be meat, she never, ever served pork never serve bacon, lard, nothing of the kind. So I think they were just wonderful. And they left early in the morning. We could not move. We just stayed in that room. If you had to go in the bathroom, you used an, uh, a bucket because there was no insulation. So if the people on either side would hear you, that's too suspicious. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, there was uh, one thing the, the man who brought us there from the underground said, no diaries, because this is what brought Miss Anne Frank all the diaries. He said, under no circumstances will there be any diaries. They had three children. One son was away. He was in a, I guess you call it, in a school to become a uh, priest. And there were two others. There was Harry. My foster brother, who was nine, and really my foster sister, who was 11. They were magnificent because they could never bring any children in the house to play. No, never, ever. If a family member would come, they would somehow always say, oh, you have to excuse me, I have to go in the bathroom, would run in and, and just yell, disappear. And we would go in a, in a broom closet if we didn't have the, t uh, the opportunity to go upstairs. The moment they got home, we, uh, we could go in the bathroom, which, which, I mean, those little things which you take for granted take on great importance then when you can't use it. Uh, my mother would do the cooking. And uh, so when the lady came home, she had a ready-made meal, whatever there was available, but they were magnificent, and I still have contact with them. Esther, I'd like to back up just a little bit. Uh, when you first went into hiding with this first family, were they part of an underground? They personally were not part of the underground, but their son was. And as I had stated previously, their son and I, we became friendly. And th that was already in our minds, the disappearing to live underground. And so the parents got together and uh, 
And this is, I guess, how we got there because especially the pressure of their oldest son who said that is the right thing to do because if he was so very active, you cannot let Jews just go to the Germans. I don't trust them. What was their name? Uh, Basems. B-E-Z-E-M-S, Basems. I don't recall their first names. The man of the house was wonderful. She was a very obnoxious creature. In fact, she was so bad that after the war, I understand her children left her. Now, the, sec the second family, as I stated before, were absolutely wonderful. Their name was the Bear, uh, small D-E, capital B-W-E-R. I have con I still have contact with Harry and Willie. In fact, I call them my foster brother and sister. Every time I go to Holland, which I do about twice a year because my parents lived there, now my mother, my dad passed away last year, lived there, so lives there. And we always see each other. They were at the funeral of my dad, they were at the uh, uh, the placing of the Machtsave there, and I mean, they're just great. In fact, we mentioned once, my sister and I, we mentioned to him that um, when my parents are no longer there, we will have no home. And he said, don't worry, Esther, you always will have a home. Um, they were very Catholic, and they went to confession almost every other day or so. And then they came back and told us about it. And we, we were afraid because very many Catholic priests that just ran to the Germans and told them about it. We said, oh, brother. But this priest was the most wonderful man. So we really were very, very fortunate. He came, and uh, he was a young man. He brought us books. Now, you have to understand, the family we were with was a laborer's family. Laborers did not go to a public library because that's a dead giveaway. They don't read. So he would bring us books from the library or from the uh, parish library. He uh, gave us homework. He corrected it. He figured out the Jewish holidays for us. I mean, he, is, he was just great, absolutely great. I guess we must be one of the very few people living underground who really were not undernourished by the time the war was over. They had rabbits in their backyard, and a rabbit, uh, a rabbit, I guess, takes 90 days for them to have little ones. So we had rabbits. Very often we had uh, mussels, which was not on coupons. And whatever they had, we would have. If they had one egg from a farmer, she would boil it and make four pieces out of it, and each child got a quarter. So they were just magnificent. What did that room, was there a window in that room? There was a window, yes. But you never went to that window, you just stayed away. We were facing the backyard, and uh, you just were very, very quiet. I guess in those days I learned never to open my mouth because I can sit still for hours and never open my mouth. And, uh, well, we just stayed there we were liberated in f October 44. We were liberated by the Polish, British, and Canadian troops. The British were the uh, Desert Rats, the Eighth Army. And, one e and we hadn't gone out yet because we didn't trust the Germans. So we didn't go out and they, somebody rang the bell and uh, Tom to meet answered it in, in a English soldier was there and he says, you have uh, some Jews hidden here and she got scared. She says, no, 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 don't worry about it, don't worry about it. I'm a British soldier and he had received the name of that the Bear family from a pharmacist who was active in the underground. Now don't ask me how she knew where we were, but anyway, she knew and she sent, because he wanted to meet some Jews, and so she sent him there, and he came. 
Uh, he was great. He was a German Jew who had fled to England with his parents, and he brought us coffee and chocolate and so forth, and he wasn't there long, and then he just left. Shortly after that, we left too, and we found a little room in another family. My mother said she'd lived long enough with the bears, and so we just, we just wanted a change of scenery. I had to go to work because I was past the age of 16. My sister was not, so she had to go to school. I was working as a dental technician, and then I was working for the British, uh, oh God. We were checking letters from the, uh, the German prisoners of war. And as I was fluent in German, I could do that kind of work. And in the evening, I would get to the office and, and ask to give us a house. My mother wouldn't do any of those things. She says, I can't handle them in. And I learned to be a nudge. I would go there every day, five days a week. I said, I need a house, I need furniture, I need linens. And you will see me till you give it to me. And apparently, that was just a little bit too much for them to swallow. Then after a month or two, they gave me a house, which was bombed out, but at least it was a house. They gave us furniture, which belonged to uh, some uh, German collaborators, and they gave us some uh, linens because we didn't have anything, nothing. What happened to your things that you left uh, when you had to go into hiding? We walked out the back, and uh, that was it. We left a completely furnished house. That was it. Nothing. Nothing happened. They took it. We didn't have anything. Did you go back there? No. That was taken over by Germans or by collaborators. We don't know. But I we mean after the war. Oh, I drove past there once, but that was it. That's it. Finished. I wouldn't go back there. I wouldn't even ring the door, but to find out how the rooms are located? No, I'm not interested. And uh, so we, we got this apartment, or this house rather, another townhouse. And once I was walking on the street after work, and I saw a fellow with a Morgan Dovid on his uniform. And I would never have done this in my life, but because this Morgan Dovid I went up to him and asked him if he was Jewish. He said, yes. I said, well, I'm a Jewish girl. I just came back out of hiding. And uh, so I dragged him home with me. And he was from the Jewish Brigade, which was part of the uh, British Army. I was so exciting, I'm telling you. It was just fantastic. So he stayed home. And the word spread that that was kind of a halfway a stop in Tilburg. And they would go from Marseille to Bergen-Belsen and brought Jews back for Aliyah Beit. And we had a whole block with, uh, with trucks, and we had all the soldiers there, and they would bring us coals and food, and they came through uh, Brussels, and they had letters from my grandparents. So they were, I mean, that was a fantastic time, really fantastic. They wanted to, me to go to Israel, but my mother said, no, you have to take care of the family, you don't go. And I didn't. Were you, while you were in hiding, was there any communication at all that you could get a letter out no, to? No, we didn't do anything. We didn't get any letters out. We didn't receive anything. We were so careful, no, because if they, God forbid, would have been caught, they get killed and so would we. No questions asked. We just kill. No, no communication with anybody. I know that your father survived Auschwitz. Yes, he did. How did you learn that he was alive? How did I, when I was working as a dental technician, that man at this, uh, he was head of the Jewish community in Tilburg, so I had contact with the Red Cross. And I looked at the lists, and I asked umpteen dozen people if they had seen a man, or described him, showed him pictures. And I said, one man said, yes, he looks familiar, but he always claimed he had no children and no family. I said, that's right, because we had discussed that should he ever be caught, he would say he had no family. And then he said, but he has lost his arm. I said, I somehow know that. And that's a very funny thing be to go into such, a, ex such an experience, but I once dreamt that, that he would lose his hand, but he would come out alive. 
And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. I knew that a year in advance, so it didn't even shock me. So I knew my dad was alive. And then it took a while because he was in a Russian hospital. That was on the death march from Buchenwald or from Birkenau. I don't know where I wanted to take him, but anyway, that was the death march. The Russians came from the east and they just marched the Jews and put them in a shed and shot up the shed. And about 18 survived, that was all. So he was in a Russian hospital for about half a year still. At that point you could contact him? No, no way of contacting. That he was 18 months in a, uh, there was 18 survivors and then he was half a year in a hospital, we found out later. No contact with anybody. There, there is no Russian Red Cross. Well, if there is, we never had any contact with it. And so my dad eventually made it back, and we had already, before the underground experience and all that said, if we ever would be separated, this is where we would go, uh, this family, and we did, and that's how we made contact with, with each other. What happened when he came back? Well, he was skinny. He was very depressed because he had lost his right arm, his right hand, and we had to try to build up a life. Now, we had requested that <coughs> we would go to, uh, uh, to America because we didn't know my dad really was alive, but uh, I was falling under the German quota. My sister and mother went under the Polish quota, so that qu uh, quota wasn't, uh, was filled immediately. The German quota wasn't. Was it that way? So I went, but my mother and sister stayed. And in the meantime, my father was, was an extremely brilliant man, built up another career. What was his career? Industrial consultant. And I came here, and here I am. My parents never wanted to come to the States, and they are over there. And my sister eventually left too, came here. And she lives in Los Angeles now. And that's really about it in a very small nutshell. What year was your father and your family, all of you, reunited? It must have been in 19, 1946, must have been. Yeah, because I came already in 1947. It must have been 1946. I really have blackouts with all those years. Things just tumbled so fast that I really don't, the times don't even recall it. But I came here in 47, the end of 47. Did you have a sponsor? I must have had a sponsor because otherwise you didn't get in here. Now, I don't remember it was my aunt and uncle or it was some very distant cousin of my father in Detroit. I really have no idea who sent me the affidavit. I really don't know. But I just got one, and I came here with twenty-five dollars to my name, and that was the beginning and the end of the story. So I had to find a, a job real fast if I wanted to live. Who? Where did you? Where did you come? To, to I where? came to New York, stayed two weeks in New York, then I went to Columbus, Ohio, where I had an uncle and aunt at the time, and my grandparents lived there. I stayed with my aunt and uncle exactly two weeks, and then very unceremoniously was kicked out of the house. Why? Why? Because I was too much of a bother, and uh, I was just, just didn't work out. They would read my letters, which I got from my parents. I mean, as far as relatives are concerned, you can have. <laughs> um, so I went, and I got in a, a room across the street from where my grandparents lived, and I had to find a job, which I did selling selling shoes, and I worked in an office. I hated it. And shortly after that, I got another, uh, I have another aunt and uncle in Chicago, so I went to Chicago. And uh, I wasn't much better of a setup anyway. I, had a, I really only had a, uh, a bed in a house. That was it, I only, didn't even have a room, I just had a bed. And I started working as a dental assistant. 
Then I got married. How did you meet your husband? Through a blind date. Who introduced you? Some friends of my aunt's knew a fellow, and then she had a niece, so they got the two of us together. And that was it. And then I kept on, kept on working at this, uh, as a dental assistant and then in, in an office. Then after my first son was born, I quit work and stayed home like, a, like the mothers did in the 50s. They stayed home. After my second one was born, through a friend who knew the head of radiology at Michael Reese, I got into the radiology program and the uh, radiology technologists program. In those days, it was first of all in the hospitals that trained you, and you had to be interned, and of course not married. But he says, okay, I know exactly what you have gone through. I let you be part of the program. That's how I became a uh, radiology, radiology technologist, which I did for 25 years, and I retired uh, last September. And now? And now I'm a very part-time worker for Nordic Track as a fitness consultant. Do some volunteering, do some, what do I do, some physical uh, exercise, some folk dancing. And then I have to try to find some more things, some more, do more volunteering jobs go to Holland to visit my mother, go to Israel to visit my son and family, and that's it. You have how many boys? I have two boys, four grandchildren. And their names? David is the oldest, Danny's the youngest son. Then Danny has two sons, Odette and Ariel. And uh, David has a son, Michael, and a daughter, Jennifer. I'd like to go back a little bit <clears throat> again. Um, when you were in hiding with the De Beers, you never left that room for how, for how many years? How many years were you there? It was close to two years, year and a half. Yes, once I left it, I remember. I had a terrible toothache. What are you going to do if you have a toothache? called the underground. Well, somebody went there and told them she has a toothache. We have to do something about that. So I was picked up and taken to a dentist who was working for the underground too. Now in Holland, you mainly have your offices in your own house. And this man had a big house. So we, they, uh, the underground brought me there and said, Esther, don't get ever out of this room because he has a different person from illegal person in every room in the house, so don't ever leave your room. So when the dentist was ready for me, he took me in and he, he pulled my tooth. He couldn't do much more. He couldn't treat it or anything, because I never could come back for a follow-up. He just pulled the tooth, and that was minus my toothache. That was the only time I went ever out. And I, uh, what else did I do in the evening? Well, I was the only one who did that. I put my hair up under a cap put on a coverall and went in the backyard and was sewing wood. They wouldn't they would let me do it when it was pitch dark. And somebody would say anything, Oh yeah, I need somebody to do that for me and I just found the the man to cut some wood for me. It's the only time we never went out. No summer, no winter on us and you just stayed put. I mean, nowadays, if I would think a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old to put them under such a strain, I just couldn't possibly believe that anybody would be that mature and realize the consequences if they wouldn't keep their mouth shut. Unbelievable. But they were great, and everything worked out for the best. That's really all. I really have. don't have anything else to tell you. What about your mother and sister? 
Well, my mother is now a widow, and she's still staying in Amsterdam. Her health is pretty poor, but she refuses to come here. And uh, there's nothing I can do about it anymore. My sister went to Los Angeles. She's married. She has two girls. And we seem to be making our biannual trips to Holland. She wanted my parents to come, but I didn't want to come. It's a very difficult situation, believe me. And yet again, it's nothing we can do about it. So now that I have a son in Israel, he says, Mom, Dad, come to Israel. For goodness sake, let me look after you. Don't make the same mistake your parents made to stay in one country and the son in another country, daughter in another country, and you do nothing but commute back and forth. It's ridiculous. Come and stay with us. How do you think your war experiences affected the way you parented your own children? Maybe I was very, very strict. I said, learn as much as you can because knowledge nobody can take away for you, from you. You do not go to school for all these social contacts that you can make if you have time. You go to school to learn and nothing else. I was very strict with them. And I, because I really didn't have a childhood. And to this day I have blackouts. Since I'm, I joined the hidden child, it is like a catharsis if everybody talks about their experiences that things start coming back, but there were things in my life that I just had completely shut out and I didn't remember anymore. Uh, when I would punish the boys, they said, well, just take it with a grain of salt. She isn't normal anyway. You see, that's what the, my boys would say, that I wasn't normal. And it's done me a lot of good to be a member of that uh, Hidden Child organ Organization. When did you get involved in that? About two, year, two and a half years ago. And we're all in the same boat. We have people from Poland, Yugoslavia, lots from Belgium, France, Germany, Holland. A lot have much worse experiences than I have. In fact, in comparison with them, I had now my experiences weren't bad at all. Because I'm one of the oldest ones and they were uh, given, a, so to speak, given away by their, by their parents as babies. Some of them didn't even know they were Jewish. <clears throat> and that's I really have nothing else to say. I'm glad I'm alive now. To have my grandchildren that I can enjoy. I plan for one trip to Israel to the next. If you had a message to give, what would that message be? A message to whom? To the American public or to my grandchildren? To whomever. Well, I'm very happy about the tape because I will be able to have a, a copy made and give it to my grandchildren so they will know where their grandmother comes from so that they will never, ever forget what went done. That they will continue telling their children and so that it will never be forgotten. Because now even you will go and ask some Jewish American kids who, whose parents were born here and they will not know anything anymore. What's that? Nothing. And just about three weeks ago, we were asked by my neighbor's daughter who is attending a Catholic high school to speak. And these girls were so appreciative that we did because they, have taken, they were taking a special course in the Holocaust. So there you have a group of children of, I mean, yeah, 16 years old, 16 year old and young adults that they will never really forget because they know, oh, well, I have a neighbor who went through that and it meant so much. When I have talked to some Jews, what, what's that? You know, is, if the parents don't hammer it into them, they will forget. And the world can never, ever forget.
because there are now already so many that will deny that there was a Holocaust. When you first came to the United States, how were you received by Americans? I had no contact with real Americans because the people I met in New York were Germans who had come about, a two, about in 38. Then I came to Chicago and I was received by my aunt and uncle and they were rotten. And then I came to, uh, uh, no, to Columbus, they were rotten. Chicago, they were not as bad. So actual contact with one of the Americans I really had. Even to this day, almost everybody I know is from either Eastern European or German ancestry. So a real died in the wool Americans, I really don't know. Then there would be uh, Gentiles. And then, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, when we came, when I came here, those American Jews that you would meet at work or so, they, they weren't interested. They says, oh, we have heard enough, we've read enough, we don't bother us, just leave us alone with all your problems. That was the attitude. And it was so horrible because now that the last survivors of the Holocaust are dying off very slowly, you cannot let the world forget what went on because it could happen again. Just think, uh, look what's going on in Germany with the neo-Nazis. You mentioned that uh, your grandparents were in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. how, did they, how did they get to America and when? They went to America, it must have been about 40, 46, because they have two sons here and they didn't want them to stay in, in Brussels, so they asked them to come there. My mother wanted her parents in Holland, but Holland didn't let anybody in legally. It was just impossible. Now, every time Dick and Harry can go into, uh, into Holland, they have so many illegals there, it makes your head swim. In those days, right after the war, they would not let anybody in illegally, and for legally, we wouldn't get a permit for all the money in the world. Because from Germany to Belgium, my, pa my grandparents went illegally. You had to bribe certain officials, which my dad did, and that's how they got out of Germany. When you were with the De Beers, were you, did you pay them to live with them? To tell you the truth, I really don't remember anything about the finance. Before the war, my father had made contact with a farmer in that, in that village where he was working, and somehow there must have been a contact person who brought, brought us food, and the illegals brought us food stamps. But money-wise, I don't know whether my mother paid him. I really don't know. She never told me. But they certainly didn't make any money on us. Definitely not. It was um, really just done because they felt you had to help. That was just the right thing to do. But finance, I really don't know anything about it. I just remember that after war, we didn't have anything. This is April the 6th, 1995, in Skokie, Illinois. Esther, I'd like to go back a little bit to uh, your relationship with the De Beers and yes. how it is today. Well, the old De Beers turned to meet an uncle and Omiyan. They are no longer here, they are dead. And their oldest son, Jan, he's dead too, even though he's much younger than I am, but he died of a massive heart attack a few years ago. Harry and Willie, both married. We have a wonderful relationship. We see each other every time we go to, the, to Holland. They come and visit. And in fact, they are so nice because my mother can no longer travel. They, Harry comes with his car, picks up my mother, and 
drives us back to his house. It's about a two-hour drive. We have a good time, and then he drives my mother back, and then he drives back. I mean, he's on the go for s close to eight hours. But it's just great. You have a wonderful relationship. We will never forget. If it wouldn't be for them, we wouldn't be here. And what special thing do you, do you see on his wall in his home? Uh, that uh, we had bought some, some trees in recognition of the good deeds that they had done. That's to the, J, I guess, the GNF, Jewish National Fund. But I, I mean, anybody who does not have a good relationship with the people that you were hitting, I, I don't understand that because you owe them their, your life. And we don't forget that. What do you know about the Jewish underground, about the underground in, in Holland? When, um, I just knew one fellow personally, and that is the brother of the fellow I was friendly with in whose house we finally lived underground for a while. He was active in uh, raids of uh, government offices where they kept their food stamps and clothing stamps. That's what he did. I knew another man who was working for the underground, and he was the head of uh, the first aid, which was not connected with a hospital. He was, uh, it was a building, and uh, he was active. And he took care of it that we had this address with the bears. Now, this man, and his name was Meneer Commandeur. Um, he was an ambulance driver. There were Jewish women who gave birth to kids, and he would take them in an ambulance to a hospital. And then immediately after delivery, he would take them back again. It took care of that the children were taken care of. I mean, this is the kind of work that I was familiar with. But uh, really uh, co um, illegal combat, and uh, like they did in Poland in the forest, the partisans, I don't think they had that in Holland. Because it, the country is too flat, there were no forests. It was mainly uh, raids on, on offices and uh, ruining bridges, helping pilots. That's what they mainly did. How did they uh, get these food stamps and clothing stamps to people like yourself? Well, a group raided that office where they had the stamps, and they distributed to other members of the underground and who knew again of people who were hiding someplace. It was all by word of mouth. And that's how people got it. How did you use these? I mean, yeah. I know that you had to, that you used it instead of money, you mm -hmm. know, to buy. Well, no, 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 you needed money too. But with money alone, unless you had oodles of it, you didn't get much. Now, we gave them to Tante Meat, and she was a very careful woman. And she didn't do this, in, she didn't buy stuff in one store, because that would be a dead giveaway. How come she needed, she had so many more stamps suddenly? So she would spread her business. Uh, when I mentioned in the other tape that we were not undernourished, she, uh, her uh, Tante Meat sister was married to a butcher. And with all the German supervision and so forth, there was always some stuff that ended up in the black market. And Tante Meat sister would give her sister occasionally some meat. This is how we had meat. And just before we were liberated, not too far out of Tilburg, they were fi the, Pola, the Poles and the Germans were fighting. And then the next morning, uh, the butcher and some friends, they would go out and see how many horses were killed. And he would check the horses, whether they were not diseased or anything, and if not, he would take them uh, to his butcher shop, cut them up, and then give them away to, to the underground. That's how we had horse meat. I never could take, eat that. I would take one bite of horse meat and I would see this gorgeous horse in front of me and I just would, ugh, I couldn't eat it. 
but that's how we had uh, food. And then they had chickens in the backyard and rabbits, as I said before. Do you think that uh, anybody else knew? No. That you were hidden, just the De Beers? Right. In fact, they were so careful. Tante Meat's parents had their golden wedding anniversary, and the Germans gave you special coupons to celebrate. And the whole family, they went to church in the morning, and then they went to their house, and we were alone. Now, so we shouldn't be alone so much, and so we should be able to stretch our legs. One of the kids would come every three to four hours and bring us some goodies and say, okay, stretch your legs, talk a little bit. I mean, that's how nice they were. Did they ever bring you, did they bring you news of the outside? Oh, from the outside? Yes. Well, um, we had, of course, the German radio, but then we had an illegal radio, which was the size of a cigar box. And we could get the BBC, and we would sit in a closet, we would have blankets over our heads, and we would listen to the BBC with, with earphones. So we knew more or less what was going on. And towards the end, uh, on sunny days, you, would, you know, you risked maybe a little bit too much. You'd be in the backyard and you could see the, uh, gl the uh, airplanes, the gliders, how they came down, and you could see the troops jump. That was in Belgium. We were not too far away from Belgium. Tilburg is not too far away from Belgium. But we knew pretty well what was going on as far as troops, but anything else about uh, uh, the Jews, no. What did you hear? I mean, sounds that you heard. We heard a lot of shooting during, you know, towards the end, we had an awful lot of shooting. We didn't even go upstairs. We would all sleep on the main floor, one next to the other, with a lot of blankets over us. I mean, you didn't want to have a, a roof. I mean, we just slept all together. We felt safer that way. Good. Four, seven people in a small room. What did you hear on, on the radio on, about the close of the war? They will give you the troop movements, they will tell you about the Americans, they will tell you uh, about the the Allied progress, about their defeats. I mean, uh, Arnhem, you probably heard about the uh, battle in Arnhem, that was in 40, the end of 44, 45, but we were liberated by that time already. The rest of Holland, the northern part was not liberated till 45, but we were liberated in October 44. But we, we knew what was going on with our little bitty radio. Were you anxious to leave the De Beers? No, I wasn't that anxious at all. No, my mother was. I wasn't. I would have stayed there probably till I got, I don't know, myself organized from, I wouldn't call it prisoner, but from a detained person to a free person with, without having all the uh, new uh, demands on me falling all over me. And I would have taken it easier but it didn't work out that way. When did you leave the De Beers? How soon after you were just... Maybe six weeks after that, we left. My mother wanted to leave, so we left. And that's when I found a job. But we, of course, there was no contact with the northern part of Holland because they lived through their worst winter. In the cities, there literally was nothing to eat. They had to eat flower bulbs. In the Jewish neighborhood in Amsterdam, those apartments were empty. They raided them for the wood and burnt the wood. It must have been the most horrible thing 
I talked to people who have lived through it, and it must have been horrible. In the country, it wasn't so bad. I mean, right after the war, there was a 44 still, and we had, at that time, we had the Canadians in Tilburg. And uh, they gave us food. They gave us, oh God, corned beef, coffee, cigarettes. Cigarettes, I didn't smoke, but I would take the cigarettes and the coffee and go to the Dutch farmers on a bicycle without tires, without rubber tires. It's beautiful to ride one without tires and try to get uh, eggs and butter in exchange for cigarettes and coffee. And usually it worked. They didn't catch you. By catching, I mean that was the Dutch police. They didn't want you to do those things. And then, let me see. What was going on among the Dutch community in Tilburg, what was the response towards Jewish people after the liberation? I really don't remember anything about that at all. The Jewish Brigade, they started the first service after the war. In fact, I still have a little city it was one of, which one of the boys gave me. And we, f we saw just a handful. That was all that was left. There was a synagogue, and the Germans had used it for some kind of a bar, and then we cleaned it up. And there were some, um, there were some boys and girls, and we started a Zionist organization. And that was really about all the life. But as far as any interaction with Gentiles, we didn't have any. We really never had any Gentile acquaintances. We had one. And we had given her some, some things, and she refused to give it back. What did you give her? We gave her some furniture. And she says, no, that's mine to keep. I didn't expect you to return. So she kept it. So you did go back then to your, your home in Tilburg, your house? No, no, no. We got another one assigned. Mm -hmm. But we just ran into that lady. And my mother asked her, and she said, no, I didn't expect you to return. It's mine now. So describe your apartment after you left the De Beers. Describe this, this place that you were living in with your mother and sister. It was just one room in another uh, row house. It was, and, and my mother cooked downstairs in the kitchen. She shared it with the owner of the, uh, of the apartment, and that was it. It was really it was awful. As soon as I had this house, we moved into the house and did the best we could in the house. And eventually it was fixed up. That's when I said, that's when I learned how to nudge because I got things done. And this is where uh, the Jewish Brigade visited us. And later on, a girl moved in and she was a survivor of Auschwitz and we rented her a room. And uh, but as is any interaction with Gentiles, we never had any. What was going on with your sister at that time? She was going to school. She's five years younger, and she had to go to school. She was going to high school. At that time, I mean, she led a rather normal life. And then I left in four. When did I leave? Bill 47, I guess. Well, it wasn't here. Bill 47. Or 48, I don't remember. I came to the United States. How did you come to the decision that you were going to leave your parents in Holland? That decision was made for me. Um, we didn't know whether my dad was going to come back, so why should the three of us stay in, in Holland? We wanted to come to the United States, but my mother had her brothers. But I went under a different quarter than my sister and mother. I went under the German quarter, so I was the first one to go. It was just decided for me, you go. Then I went. And that, that was the beginning. And then my sister came, my parents stayed. Are you resentful of the fact that you really didn't 
have a childhood. Tell me your feelings. Yes, I am resentful, yes. I am resentful because I never had a decent education. I would, I mean, I'm not that dumb. I would have gone to school and learned something what I would have enjoyed, and I couldn't do it. Yes, I do resent that. But there's nothing I can do about it. It's no sense in, in resenting it, as even though deep down subconsciously you do. It's too late now. That maybe that's the only envy I have is people that have a good education. When you were working in Tilburg as a dental assistant, how did you learn how to do that? When I was a dental technician, not an assistant a technician. Um, well, the man who owned it, he was Jewish, and he showed me, and that's how I learned. When I came to the United States, I thought I could do that. But I had learned the whole process. In the United States, they did one thing, they ate a set, a set up that's, you set up the dentures, you make crowns, you made inlays, and you did this real fast. And I wasn't that fast, and so he told me, I wasn't fast enough, and besides that, I don't use any women. Then I tried it, in, I was still in Columbus, I tried to become a dental assistant. And I really liked the work, and then after about two weeks or so, the, man, the doctor told me he would have to let me go, and I said, why? He says, no, it's nothing with your work, but his uh, patients didn't like my accent. Now, that was a Jewish dentist. I said, well, what am I going to do? That was my experience with American Jews. It was my accent, which I have to this day. Um, so I learned a little bit here and a little bit there. What else would you like to share with us? I really wouldn't know what else. It probably comes to me t in the middle of the night. But right now, I wouldn't know what I want to share. I really got a lot off my chest. My husband got a free trip to Germany, to Frankfurt, from the city of Frankfurt. And uh, so I'm supposed to go too. But for me to go to Munich, like my second cousin, that I really have no desire to go and see. What shall I see? A few bricks? There's nobody that I would remember. They're gone. To make contacts with other Jews, says, oh, how nice to see you. I have no desire to do that. Nothing. I can't stand that side of Germans. If I hear somebody speaking Germans, I can tell you if it's a German or a Jew. I hate it. When I went on vacations with my parents, we'd go to Germany, he says, please, let us get out of this country. I can't stand it. There's just something that rubs me the wrong way. The same as Austria. I was once in Austria, and we took a tour through some grottos. And that, Ger that Austrian guy put a lot of people in a boat, and we went through those grottos. And I remember having read that those grottos were used by slave labor to make airplanes by the Henkel, the Henkel airplane factory. And I asked him in German, and he said, I don't understand a word you're saying. No, first it's in English. I said, I can't understand a word you're saying. He says, all right, I'm going to tell you in German. He said, never heard about it. I said, of course, you all have am am amnesia when, when you're being asked what you did during the war. And my parents, they were shaking. Don't talk like this. Don't talk like this. Pretty soon he's going to do something to you. I mean, they still had that fear. That was after the war. They still had that fear of the damn Germans. So I could hardly wait to get out of Austria. They are, they are born anti-Semites. 
what are some of the things that you're afraid of today? What I'm afraid of personally, God forbid there would be another war in, in Israel and my kids would have to go there. I mean, have to go in the army. I mean, not the army per se, but there would be another war. That's what I'm afraid of. But here, nothing in Welsh. There's nothing I'm afraid of. I mean, I can't stand those neo-Nazis, the uh, deniers of the Holocaust. But to really be afraid, uh, the only thing I can try is talk against it. But that is all. Do you have dreams or nightmares about the war? Well, very rarely, very rarely. Used to be more, but uh, it's... Uh, I mean, that was not a dream. That was still before we went into hiding. Somebody rang the bell late at night, and my father vaulted out of the house. He jumped over a fence. I didn't go anywhere. anywhere. I just was lying in, in bed shivering, but it was false alarm. But they don't have any nightmares anymore. Since I joined the Hidden Children by talking about it, that took away having to rehash it with yourself. So that helped a lot. What was your worst experience in hiding? The worst experience, as I mentioned before, was when we had to leave the house at, in the evening and go to that school to sleep in one of the classrooms. Not that we had to sleep on a mattress, that didn't bother me, but to go out of the house into another building a huge school and being there all by myself as my mother, that was a frightening experience. And everything pitch black because everything was blacked out. It was a horrible experience. Just horrible. What was the best experience? When we came the first night to Tante Mita and Omian and they said, we don't have much, whatever we have, we shall share with you. And they had little pastries and some coffee, everything was, of course, surrogates. It wasn't real, you know, no real coffee. And I thought that was so lovely. And she would, she, I mean, if, if we had a cup, if she had a coupon for, for candy with the ch uh, for the children, she would always share it with us, always, never give the children anything, ever, that we wouldn't get to. I think that's a great experience. At night, when you were able to speak, what were some of the things that you talked about with your mother and your sister? We would talk about what my dad would be doing if he's around, what would happen with him. We would talk about uh, the, um, the Allies were doing, if we were going to be liberated, how long this was going to go on, whether we would die, whether, you know, whether we would live. That, that really was about it. it. You wouldn't believe this. You didn't do anything all day, but at night you were dead tired and you went to sleep. Dead tired from doing nothing. I mean, we read because the, the priest gave us a lot of books, so we read. And that's, uh, my mother did a lot of handicraft. She did a lot of crocheting and stuff like that. That was it. Was there any light in that room? Um, at night we had a little bit of light, yes, but of course everything was blacked out. But we had a little bit of light, yes. But only if there was somebody in the house, not otherwise. Did you socialize with the De Beer family? What do you mean in by... In the evening, I mean... Oh, yes, sure, we sat together after dinner, after the dishes were done. We would sit together till... So we went to bed. Oh, yes. We never separated. You know, when, when they were there, we were downstairs. Oh, yes. They were great. Whereas in the first place, we were always by ourselves. Always. 
and uh, at, especially at night, my sister was there by herself. And in the beginning of the war, it was in 40, 1940, in May, already in July, uh, no, in May 40, Rotterdam was bombed. And a lot of people went from the coast in the country itself to stay with relatives and so forth. So we all were said that if my sister would be found, she just has to say that she came from Rotterdam and she had no papers, they were just lost or her parents had them or whatever. But we were never downstairs, never. When you had this false um, document, mm -hmm. did you have the did you have the occasion to use it? No, thank God, no. Nobody ever stopped me. I mean, when I went to the dentist, no. I preferred it that way. How did you get around? before the Germans really took over and made you go into hiding. Mm -hmm. How did you get around and, you know, you knew things were bad and that there was a possibility of being picked up? I mean, my best, what do you mean by getting it off one place to another? Yes, I mean, I knew that you, you know, you probably walked or rode a bicycle, but the emotional feelings Um, well, after I was kicked out of school, there was one girl, and she always brought the work to me, or no, to her house. I would go to her house and pick it up. And there was, that girl had a British mother, so she hated everything German, and we just exchanged some schoolgirl gossip. And she gave me some books and uh, some work, and then I would do it, and then we would the next day or so we would go over that and then later on that died a natural death when it wasn't safe for Jews to go to Gentiles houses. Um, for a while being a Girl Scout would still keep up and that died a natural death because it was, there were too many Jews there and they disappeared one after the other. So there was really not much contact. Especially with Gentiles, no. No, with Jews for that matter. What were some of the restrictions that they placed on you? Well, let me see. First of all, you had to hand in all your silver and gold. Then you had to hand in radials. Then you had to hand in bicycles. Um, then you couldn't go out it's after a certain time at night and you couldn't get out after a s before a certain time in the morning. Well, that's enough restrictions. Where did they, did you have to bring these things to them or did they come? And no, you had to bring it. Mm -hmm. Did you hide any of your, anything? Mm, yes, there's a, there's a silver candelabra which was hidden and uh, some silver and some books were hidden, but the books, the people were afraid and they tore them up. There was the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. Some of the silver survived. A lot of pictures survived. And that's really about it that survived. Where, where did you hide these things? There was this, this uh, Oh, he was a baker in Holland. My dad had befriended, and he had some other people's stuff, too, in a false wall. It was just pushed in there. Five in Skokie, Illinois, United States of America. When you were ready to go into hiding with the first family, who brought you there? I guess we just walked there by ourselves. It was in the middle of the day, and in the middle of the day we could walk, and we just walked in, went over to their house, which was about a half hour, 40 minute walk. And uh, that's it, we just walked in. But prior to that, my parents had seen to it that uh, we had a uh, big box with 
there was a food brought over there which we had hoarded and clothes and all that was over there already which they had picked up in our house in the middle of the night. But we just walked, we walked over there. Your father wasn't with you at that time? Yes, as far as I remember, he just went along and then he said goodbye and we went to Amsterdam. What was his reason for going to Amsterdam? Do you ever hear the expression, Oberholchen? My, my father knew everything better than anyone else. He didn't want to be in hiding. He was going to make up with the Germans. So he went to Amsterdam and he thought he could somehow manage to survive there. And then the way he told us that he was living with a Jewish family and they had a raid in the house and the Jewish family was asked, um, are there any Jews around here? And they said, yes, upstairs. And that was my father, so they told him that he was there. So they picked him up and sent him to, first to Westerbork, which was the, uh, I wouldn't call it a concentration camp, it was a little work camp in Holland, the west of Holland, no, the east of Holland, east of Holland, I get mixed up with my directions. And um, he was there for a while, and then he was sent to uh, Auschwitz. When you were ready to go to the De Beers, who made these arrangements for you? The underground. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't know anybody because their son was active and he had been warned, or his, his parents rather had been warned that if they knew of any Jews in their neighborhood or in their house, maybe they knew that they must disappear. And uh, we, we just uh, were picked up and we just walked over to the bears. It's, it was quite a walk, 45 minutes in the middle of the night, it seems interminable. And I guess they must have picked up this, the clothes later on because we didn't have anything with us except what we have in our body. Were there any other people at the De Beers ever? Yes, yes. When we were there, when we came, there were two other people that were hiding two Jews, and then they were with us for about a week, and then they left and went to another place, and we stayed. And sometimes some, some uh, Gentile Dutch people would come because uh, they needed a place to stay a night or two because they were wanted for various reasons. So they were open, uh, always an open address. But that stopped after a while because that really made my, ma my mother very nervous to have people come and go. So that stopped, and it just was the three of us. What type of person was your mother, is your mother? My mother cannot take control. She has always been told what to do by my father. So it's very difficult for her to assert herself, very difficult. And it just seems that she's afraid. I just talked to her when I was there last. I said, how come you don't want to do this? I asked her, why didn't you learn how to ride a bicycle? I mean, in Holland, everybody knows how to ride a bicycle. I said, I'm scared. And she's scared of this, she's scared of that. I said, you know, it seems to me that your whole life is put together. You're afraid of everything. And she said, yeah, I'm a very scared person. And that's really what she is. Did she give you and your sister any emotional support when you were in hiding? Well, yes. I mean, it was it was, it was our mother, and uh, you you talked with her, and uh, maybe we talked what we would do when we get out alive, and uh, I mean, we were still real, real small. You needed somebody to talk to, to depend on, and so we depended on her being the older one. And we figured, well, she would take care of everything. But it was very hard for her to take control. When she was a little girl, her father adored her and took care of everything. Then she married and her husband took care of everything. 
So she never really had a chance to take over. And in the house, she, she took over from time to meet. She did the cooking, which was nice. Gave her something to do, and then we knew what we were eating. And that was really about it. What was the reunion like when your father came back? I was quite tearful. And then he talked, but he never talked about Auschwitz, never, never. He just talked about his experience in, in Russia and in the Russian hospital. And because he was, at that time I didn't know what it was, but later on it was explained to me it was a survivor syndrome. He always felt, why have I survived and all the other millions have not? So he never talked to me about his experiences. He only talked to my younger son about it because my younger son and my parents had a wonderful relationship. But he just talked about the, the, the Russians, that their, uh, um, their doctors were, of course, not, a, not as advanced as the Americans. I'm sure he said, if I would have been liberated by the Americans, I wouldn't have lost my hand. Their skills were just next to nothing in Russia. They didn't have, for instance, they didn't have any, any anesthesia anymore. So he said he had to drink about a bottle of vodka so they, till he was out, and then they operated on his and amputated his hand. And, and he would say, for instance, what they fed you, because they didn't have much, there was a field hospital, he says what they fed us would kill other people, uh, like uh, cabbage soup and black bread, but they survived on it. And when he was well enough, he started uh, walking east, no, that's west, east is Russia. He started uh, talking, uh, walking west to, to through Germany to uh, Holland. Do you think that you, that you suffer from survivor syndrome? No, I don't think so. I may not be entirely like other people where at my age at that particular time, but I don't think I, uh, I suffer from survivor syndrome. Because the people that I know, they have lost, I mean, they may have been born here, but uh, they were not strangers to the situation and they have had more normal lives, but still, I would not consider suffering from survivor syndrome. Mm -mm. Is there anything else? No, really not. There's nothing I could think of. I really appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to talk. Thank you and for giving us the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us who this is a picture of? This is my maternal grandmother. And do you know when that was taken? I have no idea. My, let me see. My father was born in 1903, and he told me he was 17. That was 1920. Then that must have been taken around the 1920s somehow. And what country is that? Poland. That was probably taken in Tarnow. Now, this is my paternal grandfather. And he must have died in 1906 because my dad said he was three years old, so it must have been taken to the beginning 1900. It probably time off. I really don't know. How those pictures survived, I do not know. I just found them in a big box. Could you tell us about this picture? Now, this is my maternal grand... Those are my maternal great-grandparents and their whole family. Now, uh, my, um, let me see, 
great my mother my grandmother's maiden name was Stockmann and uh, this happened in Poland. They come out with the craziest names that the children do not always have the name of the parents. And <clears throat> all the men here are Engelharts. Most of them went to, to uh, Palestine, Israel now. And um, one family, they were, they were in Israel already in 1936. They were the only smart ones. And they have experienced they went with six children. They have now expanded to over 300. Where was this picture taken? This picture must have been taken maybe it must have been in Germany because they're all on there. And could you tell us about this picture? There's really, I, I really don't know anything. I found it in a box in my mother's house. And she said, this is your father when he was a young man. And it probably was taken in Munich. Let me see, is there a stamp or anything on the back of the picture that would indicate where it came from? If not, then I have no idea. And could you tell us about this one? Well, just the first word on the, of the stamp says messes, so it must be messes means an exhibit. So maybe my mother went along with my dad on, to a shoe exhibit. And do you think this was taken where? I haven't the foggiest idea. I don't know. How old do you think your mother was here? I don't think she was more than 30, if that old. And could you describe this, please? Now, this picture is 19, it says 1942, Tilburg 1943. And my dad is trying to teach these men how to repair shoes, hoping that when they have a certain skill, they would stay out of a concentration camp so they would be valuable to the Germans that they have a trade. And which is your father? The man standing and the one who has a star on his uh, jacket. Now this seems to be a German ID of mine and it was issued in 1938 because I just checked it. And what does that little ring on the corner mean? There's a hole there? Mm -hmm. The Germans must have used uh, just to punch it, that you couldn't take the picture off without ruining it. So they may have prevented having uh, somebody use it illegally, because here you couldn't take the picture off. So what did you use that for? Maybe, the, uh, see, the Germans declared all Jews without a, uh, without a state. I was stateless. So was my mother, so was my father, and everybody else. Now here I'm a United States citizen, but I didn't have a passport, so this was my official ID. Probably too hard in that. Could you tell us about this? This is my false ID, which I got not very legally, of course. Um, it really belonged to a girl by the name of Schelkens is the last name, Christina, her first name, born 13th January 1926 in Dongen. Now, when I stole that uh, ID, it had her picture in the illegal, the underground, removed her picture and put my passport picture in it, and they just uh, retouched the stamp, and then it was a very legal document because they had the German and the Dutch stamps on it and everything. And that's her signature, and her handwriting is just as poor as mine, so we matched. Okay, oh, could, now, you, could yeah. you tell us what this is? Now, this was issued in 1938 while uh, Holland was still in royalty, and it must have been shortly after we came from Germany, and it was my ID there, and then later on it was, see, nationality framed link that I was a without nationality, and then it was used later on um, to give us coupons when the Germans came, because it says Gemeente and address, it gives you the address where I lived, and then the stamp Tilburg, and the date was 7th November 39. Okay, could you tell us who this is and where it is? This is Tante Meet 
and Om Iyam the bear. Those, that is the couple in whose house we were hiding. The dog is from some neighbor because they didn't have a dog on that, that way. Uh, behind them is the house where we were hidden. Do you know when this was taken? This must have been taken after the war, probably 1944, maybe in the early 50s. Could you describe this picture for us? This is a picture of my parents that was taken. When was David married? I was at my older son's wedding in 1986. 80, 1986. Very nice. Okay, could you describe this picture for us? Now I start with the old lady, or elderly lady rather, this is my aunt, she's married to my uncle Norbert, it's my mother's brother. Then comes Claire, she is my youngest son's wife. In between them is my grandson, it's David's son, his name is Michael. Next to Michael is Daniel, that's my youngest son, he lives now in Israel. Then going around the couch, the girl in the reddish blouse, that is my niece Lori. And the boy between them is Ariel, that's one of Danny's sons, and then comes Debbie, that's my sister's uh, daughter, it's my niece too. Then behind them is Oded, the tall fellow, that's Oded, he's Daniel's son, that's myself, my husband. Then comes Robin, that's David's wife, she's holding Jennifer, and then comes David. And when, when was this picture taken? Uh, but three and a half years ago, Hanukkah three and a half years ago. And where was it taken? In Danny's house in Highland Park. Could you please introduce us to this nice looking man sitting next to you? This is my husband William Edward and you're going to be married 45 years this coming June and we will make it a point of not being in Chicago because I do not like parties. And the rest he has to tell you himself. Actually, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Most people call me Bill. I hate being called William. Usually when I get drunk mail, it says Dear William Lang or just William E. Lang, and I hate it. But uh, what would you like to know about me? I would like to know about uh, the most outstanding thing about your bride. She's the mother of two wonderful sons. Sometimes we like to choke them, but by and large we still love them. <coughs> and uh, she has put up with me for 45 years, and she's just beginning to get used to me, so she must be a very outstanding person. I want to thank you both very much for sharing your story, especially Mrs. Lang. Well, thank you. I uh, thank you too, we're very glad to. And I hope lots of people are going to get to see this. Uh, tell me about the day you first met. Well, we met on a blind date. <coughs> a mutual acquaintance uh, sort of uh, coerced me into calling Esther for a date. And she lived on the north side, I lived on the south side, and I didn't have a car. So it was a bit of a drag, really. So I went out and I bought a 13-year-old car for $200, and uh, things developed quite quickly after that. Uh, we had our first date, and then I didn't call her for about six weeks. And I called her back, and to my surprise, she accepted another date. And that was in March, just around the time of her birthday. Then we got engaged in May, on Mother's Day, as a matter of fact. We got married in June on Father's Day. And that's the story of my life. Nothing happened on Labor Day, by the way. You just swept her off her feet. Must have. I broke her glasses on the first date, giving her a kiss. <laughs> and she wouldn't accept any money to pay for them. She has changed, now she would. 
That's about it. How did you I, break the glasses? I, guess. I didn't even know that. Guess how. <laughs> Say it. A passionate kiss. <gasps> the first date? First date, yes. Are you sure I would let you? You crazy. <laughs> sure you didn't object? Should I remember? Well, it's in the foyer of the building where she lived. Oh, great. That's as far as I got, of course. I should hope so. Times have but, changed. So, so I have my glasses. Again, thank you both. Oh, you're very welcome.